Test one, two. Test one, two. Good evening and welcome to this meeting of the Planner Committee. I am Councillor Mike Lilly and I am the Chair of the Planner Committee. I will be chairing the meeting tonight. To begin the meeting there are a few matters of housekeeping. Action in the event of the emergency. There are no practice alarms planned for this evening, so if an alarm does sound, please evacuate the Town Hall by going down the main staircase uh, or the back staircase to the High Street and then to the car park behind the town hall in St Romwell Street. This meeting is being live streamed uh, to the council's YouTube page and will be available after the meeting. Please would speakers use microphones at all times and speak directly into the microphone. I would participants please mute the microphones when not speaking. We now will go for introductions and members of the committee and officers will introduce themselves, starting from my left. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lynn Barton, Shrub End Ward. I'm Councillor Robert Davidson, Mersey and Pyfleet Ward. Councillor Mike Holt from St Anne's and St John's Wards. <coughs> Councillor Roger Buston from Prettygate Ward, substituting for Councillor Roger Mannion. Sam McLean, Newtown and Christchurch. Lee Tate from Prettygate Ward. Councillor Sam McCarthy representing Shrub End Ward. Councillor Jackie McLean from Markstown Lair Ward. Chris Pearson, Labour Councillor for Beerchurch and substituting for Councillor Martin Ward. James Ryan, Planning Manager. John Miles, Planning Officer. Daniel Bird, Planning Officer. Hayley Parker Haynes, Planning Officer. And Simon Cairns, Joint Head of Planning. Robert Carmichael, Democratic Services Officer. Thank you. Members of the committee may use electronic devices to access their meeting papers and visitors are welcome to use mobile phones and other devices, including cameras. But please use them discreetly, set them to silent and do not use voice or camera flash functions. We will have a break after the completion at 7.30pm or at an appropriate time. There are toilets on every floor in the building and an induction loop in this room. Whilst determination of a plan application is not a quasi-judicial judicial process, unlike certain licensing functions carried out by the local authority, it is a formal administrative process involving the application of national 
and local policies, reference to legislation and case law, as well as rules of procedure, right of appeal, and an expectation that people will act reasonably and fairly. All involved in these decisions should remember that the possibility that an aggrieved party may seek a judicial review and or complain to the Ombudsman on grounds of maladministration or a breach of the authorities' code. Item 2, substitutions, referred tonight. We have Councillor Pearson for Councillor Warns and Councillor Buston for Councillor Mannion. Declarations of interest. Do we have a declaration of interest? Councillor Davison. Uh, yes, Chairman. Uh, 7.1 and 7.2 is owned by a councillor. Councillor Buston. Uh, item 7.4, I'm a member of the Civic Society. Actually, there, there's, on a point of order, you also have to declare what sort of interest you are declaring. Very non-pecuniary. Councillor Davison. Non-pecuniary. Sorry, I forgot about that. Councillor Tate. I have the same non-pecuniary interests as uh, Councillor Davison and Councillor Buston. Do you need me to repeat them or you can take it back? Oh, you're all members of the same party at 7.1, 7.2. Are, but I'm also a member of the Civic Society. Okay, thank you. Councillor McLean. Same as all the others, thank you. Um, uh, you're a member of the Conservative Party with yeah, the 7.1 and 7.2. Thank you. Thank you. And I've got a non I've got a non pecuniary interest in that uh, I met with the applicant planning officers on a site visit some time ago when they were looking at uh, the application for Silk Road and I popped along to see what was what was happening really. Thank you. Uh, item four urgent items. There are no urgent items. Item 5, have your say. If anyone has a petition they wish to present to me on any of the items on the agenda this evening, please do so now. Thank you. And now we move on to, the, to approve the minutes for the meeting held on to the 15th of June 2023. Do members, are members happy with the minutes? Have I got a proposal? And a second for that, Councillor McCarthy, Councillor Tate. Uh, are we all agreed the minutes are fine? So Councillor Tate wasn't here. So I thought you were second that, so. But she wasn't there. Okay, so we, can we have a second, please, for who was there? Councillor McLean. Thank you. All those in favour of the minutes, we approve. Thank you. So now we move on to the planning applications we have tonight. We have five applications. Um, we have 7.1, land north of the King's Arms uh, at Cockershaw. Uh, 7.2 is another one, separate one, the King's Arms in Cockershaw. 7.3, Northview Cottages, Great Hawksley in F6. And then we have 7.4, uh, um, Force and Bottle Street, um, otherwise known as Silk Road uh, Nightclub, and 7.5 land adjacent at Brayswick, all familiar with that. On the first three applications, 7.1, 7.2, 7.3, 7 we have no speakers on those applications. Are members happy to take those on block? Have I got a proposal for that? Councillor McLean and the seconder. Councillor so all those in favour on taking the three items on block. Raise your hands. Thank you. Oh, sorry, Chair, I think my... Can we just go? I didn't manage to see everyone there. Um, can we start again? All those in favour of taking those three applications on block, please raise your hands. Thank you, Chair, yes. that's unanimous. Thank you. And now, uh, I do have to read this little bit of the one. i just got to read this a uh, bit for uh, legal purposes. I can confirm that those items have been determined in line with the officer recommendation in the report and amendment sheet and there will, be not, there will not be further discussion on those items. Any interested parties in attendance for those items may wish to leave now. Thank you.
So now we move on to 7.4 uh, for St Bartle Street. It's recommended for approval. Uh, and we have public speaking against Howard Davis, public for Sam Good, and Councillor Gocha is here as well as ward, one of the board ward, ward councillors. So, Hayley, over to you to present the application. Please. Thank you, Chairman. Just get the presentation up, bear with me. Perfect. So partially retrospective planning permission is sought for the replacement of timber windows with UPVC windows, new timber doors at ground floor and the reinstatement of the parapet detail and clock. These are the location plans and block plan. Existing and proposed front and southern side elevation. Existing and proposed rear and northern side elevation. Photographs of the building historically and the surround. Photographs of the windows prior to replacement. And photographs of the building recently. This application is recommended for approval. Whilst the replacement of timber windows with UPVC is not normally supported, with, supported within historic areas, planning approval is justified due to the particular circumstances of this application, which should have enabled a change of use to take place within a building that has some historic value, promoting active usage of the upper floors of a commercial unit in a regeneration area. Furthermore, the proposal includes the reinstatement of a clock, which was a historic feature of the building, and therefore the conservation of the non-designated heritage asset is in accordance with national policy and should be given considerable weight. The environmental aspects of the application are considered to have an adverse impact. However, given the proposal will provide social and e economic benefits by retaining a commercial ground floor and as such providing a community leisure slash commercial facility, it is considered to outweigh the less than substantial harm identified to the historic environment. Thank you. Thank you. So now we move on to the public speakers. I call Howard Davis, please. And you're representing the Culture Civic Society tonight, aren't you? Yes, I'm not here for the person who's here. I'm representing So you have three minutes. Uh, after two, the bell will go to give you a final warning. Thanks, Chair. Thank, Thank you. you. Evening all. Um, so, as I say, I'm here as the Chair and Representative of Culture and Civic Society. And firstly, I would draw the Committee's attention to 15.7 in the report, which states, and I'm not going to read it out because I've got time, but in 15.7, essentially, there's some sort of form of, of accusation about what the Civic Society have said or not said. The Civic Society have not opined that the nightclub business is not one that is desirable for retention, and we would like the comments removed. I do believe that this, the President of the Civic Society did ask for this to be removed, but it's still on the documents I downloaded, it was still there. It should be noted that along with the shrinking demand for retail floor space, nightclub demand is shrinking at a rapid rate too. Sorry. Um, it is, is shrinking at a rapid rate too. The council should be minded of this. Perhaps this is the reason. Can I just stop you there, whoever's? It's my phone. Oh, okay, well, that we usually have a 25 pound fine for, uh, to go to the mayor's charity, Howard. Yes, yes, <coughs> Yeah, please carry on. Sorry, sorry everyone. I haven't got a finger on that. Have I? So as 15.3 of the report states, oh, sorry, this is an important bit. It should be noted that along with the shrinking demand for retail floor space, nightclub demand is shrinking at a rapid rate too. The council should be minded of this. Perhaps this is the reason for the conversion to residential on the upper floors of this particular building, once occupied by the nightclub. At 15.3, the report states that no complaints were received as part of the previous application 230533. This is inaccurate as a civic society raised an issue during the consultation period. I would like to remind the committee that in 2017, when the original application was approved, it clearly stated that, notwithstanding the details in the above conditions relating to noise insulation, 
the existing windows shall not be removed, replaced or altered in any way. Any extra glazing etc shall be placed internally. Reason, the windows to this locally listed building are original and form part of its character and positive contribution to Colchester Conservation Area No. 1. Why was this completely overlooked as part of the later application of this year? Indeed, much of the current report waxes lyrical about the importance of the conservation area and locally listed status of the buildings, a lot of historic fenestration, but just as it seems the recommendation is to put things right, reinstatement of the wooden windows, the, to the tone changes and a solution is arrived at. This, it seems, according to planning officers, is to paint the UPVC windows black. As someone once said, maybe then I'll fade away and not have to face the facts. Are windows not part of the fenestration of a building? You only have to glance across the street to see the restored building opposite at 47 St Bottle Street. The owner has carried out works to the upper floors and retained the beautiful original windows, now home to Pepe's Piri Piri, which is a national chain of Piri Piri chicken short stores. What message is being sent out to when one considers that the applicant is an ambassador for the city, being involved in both the business improvement district and associated with Pubwatch? One final thought. I have been advised that on more than one occasion, property owners owning properties in the conservation area were taken to the Crown Court by the council in order to get the property owners to reinstate wooden sash windows. This was carried out under Article 4. And I just want to urge the committee to reject this application or at least defer it so that we would be, we would be happy to take them down and show them the site if they haven't already been and, and see what effect this um, UPVC implementation has had on the building and the potential future risk to that precious street. Sorry, I overran. I'm sorry afraid that, yeah, that's your time is up. I'm sorry. Thank you. And now, public speaker for Sam Good, please, to come forward. So the same, Sam, you have three minutes. You know, score. The bell will go after two. Thank you. Good afternoon all and thank you for having me tonight. So I'm Sam Good, I'm the uh, manager of the Al Culture Business Improvement District. So we represent over 500 city centre businesses from your smallest independents uh, to your largest nationals, one of them being uh, Silk Road, which is part of this application. So you know, I thought coming here and spoke, spoke to Oz and I've been working with him over, over, over many years and you know, one thing I want to get straight to the point on and I don't think is in doubt here by anyone talking is that the need to celebrate Oz and his team as being a valued business owner in the city centre for multiple years and clearly demonstrating passion uh, for this city centre through his work through the Beard Food Pub Watch and his investment into his premises. I'd also like to thank Simon Cairns and Haley uh, for their time spent on this application considering all angles and taking into consideration how businesses operate alongside the current challenges and climate that we all face uh, as business owners and business managers. I think that's a core part of this application that needs to be considered today, that you know, even in the last year, let alone last five years, the climate that businesses are facing both financially and operationally is, is, is a world of difference. As a, as a conservation area, it's crucial that we all take pride in our city centre and invest appropriately to ensure a high standard. This application must be reviewed alongside uh, Osmond's high level of investment, both financially and in his many years of service as a clear example of a business owner who wants to do things to the best standard. You simply have to walk into his premises to understand this and appreciate it, and I hope you all do. It's referenced uh, as one of the objections around the potential precedents that could be set if this uh, application is approved. However, this must be looked at from a different angle in my view. The precedents that the precedence that risks the conservation area are buildings that are crumbling and lacking investment without outcomes. You only have to walk out of this out of the town hall and, and stare around for a few minutes to understand where that investment isn't being taken place. I have every confidence that Simon and the team have reviewed this application in depth, identified the must-haves and evidence where adjustments can be made. In this occasion, the building of key relevance to St. Bossoff's make up has received a high level of investment in a, with beautiful new windows that could have cost hundreds and hundreds of thousands more if done uh, as uh, Civic Site have requested. If you were to stand on some bot offs and survey each person walking past, I can guarantee that the majority, if not all, would 
would comment on the improvement to the upstairs windows and would not notice that, 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 that it's a, a UPVC uh, change. So I, I'd also ask for a request to review that. But therefore, I ask the planning committee to accept this recommendation for approval and understand uh, as referenced in 8.1 uh, from historic buildings around the minimal uh, negative impact uh, on this street as well. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, is there any point you want to wish? One. Oh, Councillor Gauchy, I forgot you. <laughs> oh, you have five minutes, Mark, and uh, the bell go after four. I do apologise. I was keen to get right. Thank you, Chair. Um, good evening, colleagues. Um, yeah, um, my concern about this is, is partly about fairness to start with. Um, it's a conservation area, and um, obviously there are residents who live in part of the conservation area, and if they um, um, replace their um, timber windows with these UPVC things, plenty black, I'm sure they'd be asked to replace them with timber windows. Um, so why is a business being treated differently to my, well, our residents um, who live in a conservation area? Are we, are we, are we have a two seat tier system here? That's one for businesses, one for ordinary um, residents. That's one concern. The other concern I have is, is um, it has, you know, it, it is a precedent being set that um, if, if um, a business maybe can prove that it's, it's of economic value to an area, I'm sure the Silk Road is, it really is important to the area, it's a great business. But if they can say that, they can then um, do things in a conservation area that, that maybe your ordinary resident can't do. Um, it, it just seems there's a, a difference here, a, a discrepancy here. Um, and, and that's my concern. And, um, does this mean then that a precedent is set that other businesses can do that? Can residents now um, replace their timber windows with these UPVC windows? How does this impact on what residents can do within the streets that are within the conservation area as well? So those, those are my concerns that it might lead to a kind of watering down of, of standards in, in the historic parts of Colchester. Um, but I, I welcome um, any clarification that the team can provide um, that show any kind of distinctions and the reasoning behind um, what's being proposed. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, as you brought that up, well, I should declare another non pecuniary interest in the fact that a few years ago when my, my parents' house was uh, renovated but because it needed doing a lot and they applied for one of the, the bids for the council, it's, it was built in the 1800s. The windows were, were wooden sash ones. They, the council couldn't afford to replace like for like. So a compromise was, um, was given and they were replaced with PVC ones. And I think that's available to everybody who can show that they can't afford to do such a thing. It's, it's in, but I'll pass it over to Kate and Simon to clarify that and also about the precedents because I, there, there isn't really a, something to do with that in planning, is there? And the other one I want to pick up was the, the complaints made. It states in the report that there were no complaints received from the neighbourhood properties, and the only one that we received was from the Civic Society. Is that clear? Thank you, Chairman. So in, so in respect to, of um, the neighbouring complaints, I think the Civic Society mentioned paragraph 15.3, I believe it's 15.4, and that actually references specifically enforcement complaints as part of the replacement of the windows. And also on that matter, a members update did go round to address 15.7 um, as mentioned by the Civic Society, and then that in turn updated the consultation responses as one um, letter of representation objecting to the proposal has been received, but that should have gone been circulated yesterday. Um, in terms of fairness and the president set, I think section 15 of um, the committee report <coughs> goes into quite a lot of detail, <coughs> excuse me, in relation to the planning balance that was applied in this instance. Um, it is considered that the site has a very set of specific circumstances which weigh in favour of the scheme so it's clearly identified that there is some environmental harm as a result of the works that have taken place however subject to mitigation as per the recommendations in the conditions and um, securing the upper active floors and the commercial use 
weighs in favour of the scheme and outweighs the identified harm alongside um, reinstatement of the parapet and the clock, which is, is a historic feature that was there previously. So it's unlikely that this scheme in itself could set a precedent because there's such specific circumstances which have weighed in favour in this instance to tilt the balance favourably. Um, but I'm sure Simon's got more to add. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yes, I'm referring specifically to the points raised by Councillor Gocha vis-a-vis um, -vis the comparison between residence um, uh, requirements and those commercial properties. Um, I can confirm that within the Colchester City Centre Conservation Area number one, there is no Article 4 direction and therefore single family dwellings may change their windows from timber, regrettably to PVC, at their own will. We have no control of that at all. So in fact, there is a lesser degree of control for residential properties than there is for commercial. Um, so in fact, in terms of fairness, um, you could actually almost argue the contrary argument that um, commercial properties are treated less fairly than their residential counterpart. Um, in terms of the question of precedent, precedent doesn't actually apply in planning law. Um, it's every application on its merits. And as Haley has outlined, uh, this um, is admittedly a case where there is a degree of harm identified and the detailed for, form of the windows um, is such that the harm is of the less than substantial magnitude in terms of the uh, national planning policy framework and in the opinion of the case officer that is outweighed by the public benefits that flow from the economic use but that is for members to decide whether they concur with that opinion but hopefully that clarifies those points chair thank you Councillor McCarthy. Thank you, Chair. Um, this is a regeneration area. Um, Silk Road has been there for quite some time, certainly as I was coming through, through the nightclubs and things. Um, and, you know, Oz is someone that is very proud of Colchester, I believe, and, you know, and, and obviously Sam has said that as well. Um, I'm a firm believer that if someone is willing to regenerate that area, or regenerate their, their business and their dwelling, or their, their building rather, then I'm all for it. Setting a precedent of blackout windows is nonsense. There's only one place down there that has an aesthetic that is blacked out, and that is Silk Road. So it fits in the character of the place. The replacement of the clock, all good. Um, I firmly support it, and I propose that we approve the application. Uh, okay, thank you for that. Is, yeah. is there a seconder for that proposal? Can I suggest we have a debate first, Chair? Well, yeah. the. the the procedure goes that we get a proposal and a seconder, and then we move on with the rest of the debate. Then we'll come back to that. There's no seconder for your proposal. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Davison. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chairman. Um, I have particular concerns. I understand the financial uh, problems, uh, and everybody's, all businesses have been through two or three years of uh, difficult circumstances. But here we have a listed building as well as being in a conservation area, and it's a significant, uh, a significant building. Uh, as we saw from the pictures, it's, it stands out in the street scene as, as something of character. And whereas some of the other buildings in Queen Street are less attractive. So much as I approve or uh, accept that the, he's improving the clock, and would make that a contribution to the building. I, I'm, and the report in fourteen two seven does say that you know the the, square, the rectangular windows do not match the arch windows that were there previously. It it, it is changing the character. So what I'd like to propose uh, is an extra condition, if we grant permission, that gives him two years to replace them with timber building, timber uh, windows. In other words, he's got two years to uh, get his business back up on, onto an economic basis. And in other words, we won't enforce it for two years. That was a suggestion. Something can be done, it's a bit confusing. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yes, just to clarify a point that Councillor Davidson raised, this is not a listed building. Um, this is an unlisted building, albeit on the local list of buildings of local importance. Um, 
in terms of the use of a condition, um, you have an application before you which seeks to retain the windows. I think if you wished to not retain the windows, you would be better to refuse the, the application and to allow a two-year period um, of stay of execution before enforcing replacements. Um, that would be our recommendation to you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, Councillor McLean. Yeah, I'm sorry, how do we get to the point where these windows need replacing? Why do they need replacing? And uh, also on the clock, what kind of clock is going to be is going to be on the building? Is it going to be a plastic wall clock like the windows? No, the clock it always keeps come, coming up and uh, Hayley, could we explain uh, how we got there and the clock as well? Thank you, Chairman. So there is a condition um, securing additional details in relation to the door and parapet detailing. And um, so that will secure details in relation to the clock. Um, <clears throat> and then in terms of the windows, they were in a state of disrepair. So they were replaced. Um, there were pictures in the slides of the windows prior to their replacement, which I can share again if you wish. Yes, yeah, of course. <clears throat> so these were the windows prior to the replacement. Yeah. How did the building owner let the building get into that disrepair? Could they not maintain them? I have a very old windows in my house and they get painted. I don't, I just think that's disgraceful that they're in that condition. Well, I think that uh, we're not really here to discuss what, what, what it was before. We are here to discuss that they need a replacement and the owner has replaced her and he's replaced them with the plastic ones rather than like for like and uh, and that's all we're here to discuss. So. Well, I think, I think they can replace them with wood. They've let them rot away. Okay, yeah. Councillor Buston. <clears throat> Thank you, Chairman. Um, this is a very interesting uh, matter and one that's come across to me as a great surprise, um, uh, particularly as I came late as a uh, as a substitute member. Um, <clears throat> I perhaps ought to preface my remarks by the fact that I actually have no objection to white UPVC windows. In fact, I actually think white is a nicer looking colour in many ways than black. Black is rather sombre and disappointing. Uh, however, that's, uh, it is as it is. So I have no difficulty per se with UPVC. I have no difficulty with white UPVC. I also uh, hear what many uh, folk have commented so far about the contribution um, that Osman um, and his organisation have made to the town, which I thoroughly agree with, and I know you do as well, Chairman, in other areas. That's not the point. The point that concerns me has been alluded to now three times by speakers, uh, and it's one that I've mentioned before. The Council needs to decide, bluntly, whether it's going to enforce conditions imposed or it's not and there needs to be a consistency of policy across the piece and in this instance a permission is being sought retrospectively to permit UPVC windows that have been fitted where they shouldn't have been there have been other instances um, and I referred particularly to um, a nursery school in Nexton Road where UPVC windows were fitted and they should have had wooden windows fitted and the applicant in that uh, instance was refused permission and didn't take the windows out and was taken to the Crown Court, I think it was, and was informed against. And okay, I think he will have accepted that he 
should have abided by the rules because the rules were clearly there and that's what the court said. Now, I'm not saying whether the rules are right or the rules are wrong. And what I'm saying is, if the rules are there, they're not hidden anywhere, the rules have got to be followed. And if we think the rules are wrong, and I can quite see how it can be interpreted, um, and the officer, the case officer has indicated uh, why, the rules are perhaps inappropriate in this location and what has been effected. Nonetheless, we get back to the situation where something is either right or wrong as it is laid down in the instructions that are put. Therefore, I find this a very difficult um, situation that the council has placed itself in. And I don't think it's acceptable. I think the council has got to make a decision one way or the other. It's either going to enforce its rules evenly or it isn't. That is my basic problem with this issue. It's nothing to do with plastic windows. Thank you, Chair. And, and it is a complicated matter because this has happened all over Colchester because mm. it's an old town with old houses and they're all facing that. And each one, and um, yeah, so we know how. Councillor Pearson, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I was pleased to hear uh, Mr. Cairns reply to Councillor Gocher because I think that clarified for me one of the issues around whether or not there were as a two tier issue here that we needed to consider tonight. Um, the other point for me as well is um, that remark that's published in paragraph 15.7 that the Civic Society are quite clearly saying was not their opinion. I think we need to ensure that before we leave tonight, the minutes quite clearly state that that, that should be amended. Um, the, the issue for me um, isn't about the valuable contribution that may or may not have been made by the owner of the business. Um, and as laudable as that might be, it's not a significant planning um, consideration for us this evening. I think for me the issue is about the original application back in 2017 and I've had a quick look I can't seem to find whether there's reference to that in our document tonight. If there is I've missed it so I'd like um, to come back to that. If there isn't then my recommendation would be for deferment and my reasoning behind that is not dissimilar to yours Chair. Building construction and building rules and regulations and um, specifications evolve. And we know that throughout time, wooden windows and metal windows are being replaced by UPVC or other windows that are more appropriate as we try to fight the climate emergency. So although I have some concerns about UB, UPVC replacing wood, in this instance, if there was a condition that was in place with the application in 2017, I don't have a general um, disquiet about UPVC replacing wood as a, as a, a construct going forward. But I think for me, my concern, and I, I follow Councillor Buston's concern, that if there is a condition that was in, in situ from the application in 2017, we need to have another look at that. Any comments to make about that, please, Sam? Uh, thank you. Yes, Chair. Um, with regard to Councillor Buston's comments around um, the need for consistency across the piece. I very much do understand that, but planning doesn't work in that way. Planning is not about binary application of policy because our raft of policy in the local plan, all within the plan, there are policies that seemingly conflict with one another. So one can pick on a policy. So for example, climate change and you know potentially use that to outweigh other considerations in the plan depending on the weighting that members choose to apply. So planning isn't about 
a binary application of rules such as building control, it's about shades of grey and discretion. And that discretion lies with you members. So very much, if you were to adopt a rules-based approach, that would imply predetermination. And predetermination would in itself be unlawful because every application has to be judged, excuse me, on its own merits. So in this instance, you have to weigh up the harm that is quite rightly identified in the report and by the civic society. And I have complete sympathy with the point raised by the civic society with regard to the fact that there is harm resulting. However, in the opinion of the case officer, that harm is outweighed by the public benefits that flow from the application. Now, you may choose to decide otherwise, but it is not a simple black or white decision, uh, if you'll pardon the pun. It is about shades of grey, because you can choose to give weighting to the public benefits as outweighing the harm that is acknowledged and identified within the report and identified by the uh, civic society. However, what I would say is, until we had this application, nobody had actually noticed that the windows had been changed. So in terms of identifying the degree of harm, we were all guilty of walking past this building, including myself, and no, but none of us actually noticed that the windows had been changed. Now, I would say there is a, a degree of test from the man on the, or the person on the Clapham omnibus as to the materiality of that harm. But that is for you to weigh up, Chairman and the committee and the committee and make that decision. But it is simply not one about the blanket application of rules. That is not how planning operates. It is about each application on its merits. Otherwise, we fall into the hole of predetermination and unlawfulness. Uh, back to you, Chairman. Thank you. There's one question that um, somebody asked me about if you to go to a town and you walk past a building and looked at it, would you actually know that those black windows were actually painted plastic underneath? And would you know that they should have been wooden or would you just look at it? That's a really nice building, whatever. That's quite good. So the question is, would you, when you, would you notice if, if they are painted black? Um, every issue is the same. There's also a financial issue. There is a choice. If you could turn around and say, I cannot afford to replace all these windows. So what do I do? Do you do go for a compromise or ask the council for a compromise, which has happened in this case, or do you just close down because you can't afford to replace it? That's a, a big question that we need to ask. And it's about this one application and one application only. It's different to everybody else's. Anyway, move on to Councillor Barton. Thank you very much, Chairman. Um, yeah, I do appreciate it's a delicate balance between supporting our local businesses and protecting our key conservation areas. And this is a key conservation area. Um, I do have a problem with this because when I was on the Cabinet, I was instrumental in the compiling of this local list. Now, we went out to consultation. We asked residents to let us know buildings that they valued, buildings that they wanted to see protected. And we compiled that list. And this is one of them. Um, and from that point of view, I think we should be respecting what our residents have asked us to put on that list. So I won't be supporting this application. Thank you. Councillor Tate, please. Thank you. Uh, I find myself in the unusual position of agreeing with most of most of the people around the table. Um, first off, just to, to cover some things that have been said, I'm in full agreement with Councillor Pearce and I'm sure that the businessman involved has done a lot of wonderful things for the community, but that's not, not relevant in any way. Um, if the windows needed replacing, um, why were they not replaced with wood? That's, that's my issue. The amount of work that has gone in, as Councillor Barton has alluded to, for the protection of the conservation area, I don't feel we can just ignore because nobody's noticed the windows are black. It's not the point. Um, action was taken that was against what was, um, you know, you shouldn't be doing that with that kind of property. Uh, finally, for me, though, it's this talking about if you let him have this, we'll give you a clock. Um, 
what where the clock does the clock happen if we say no do we only get the lovely clock if we if we let him have his windows that's what i think needs uh, i'd like an answer on that please Hayley. Thank you, Chairman. Firstly, I would just like to come back to one point that Councillor Pearson made in relation to reference to the 2017 application. Um, <clears throat> this is provided within the site history in 6.1. Since the 2017 application, we have received another um, application which was determined was also determined this year um, to regularise works that had been undertaken for the conversion of the, the upper floors of the nightclub. So in 2017, permission was given for the conversion to three flats. Works were commenced on site without discharging pre-commencement conditions. So to regularise them works and to provide two additional flats, another application was submitted, which is actually when we found out that the windows had been replaced. So there's, that's why there wasn't any enforcement on the condition from the 2017 application. Um, and then in respect to Councillor Tate's point, which has left my mind now, <laughs> um, the clock is part of the proposal for this application. So if this application gets refused, we cannot secure that detailing. That's why it comes into the planning balance. If the application was solely for the clock, obviously it'd be a different story, but thank you. So, any more speakers on this? Okay, so we, we don't have any proposals on the table. Well, the only proposal we have from Councillor McCarthy. Is anyone willing to second his, his proposal again? Seconded, Seconded by Councillor Hawke. And that is to uh, approve as set out in the minutes and that. So um, the condition, Councillor Davidson. Yep, sorry, I, I had suggested, and uh, uh, Mr. Cairns also uh, said it, that we could actually impose a condition, if even on refusal, um, to give him two years without uh, um, being enforced. You know, we're, we're talking about the proposal to accept it. There's a proposal to approve the application. Yeah, so yours is one if we refuse the application. But then there's no point putting conditions on it. So, Chair, we have a motion on the table from Councillor McCarthy, seconded by Councillor Hogg, which is to approve as per the officer recommendation. Now, Councillor Davidson's motion, which, um, sorry, is a condition and the point as raised by Simon Cairns can be made in a following motion should this one fail and then if that is the case then the chair I would you can then invite Councillor Davidson to make that or any other member of the committee should you wish to so we need to take the vote on this one first and then we can see where it goes okay thank you uh, so now we're now going to move to the vote on the uh, for approval as set out in the committee's reports tonight all those in favour of the application one two three three all those against all Six. those and abstentions one so that uh, proposal is is uh, refused so have we now got an app any more proposals could i make a supplementary to uh, Councillor Davidson's proposal, which I think yes, is very wise, if you'll allow me just a second. I would suggest three years, bearing in mind uh, the um, perceived economic value and the perceived cost of the windows. I think we need to be seen, if we're going to do this, to be fair. And I think that would add a degree of fairness to it. Uh, so in that, in that case, Chairman, um, I'd like to uh, recommend refusal, but uh, delay in enforcement by a period of three years uh, and encouragement to ma maintain and improve the clock. I'm, I'm so confused now. Please. Thank you, Chair. Can I just raise the issue of potentially the four-year rule and the windows becoming lawful? 
um, given that they've been in store for a little time already. So if you were to extend the three year period for compliance from this date, you could potentially end up in an uninf unenforceable situation. So my recommendation whilst I think it's a lovely gesture from Councillor Buston, um, I think it may dig an even bigger hole for all of us if that were to occur. So I would recommend that you stick with a two year compliance period if you resolve to refuse. But can we have some reasons for refusal, uh, uh, just heads of terms and we can we can propose something around them for the committee should they be so opined to do so. So you have to remember that the windows are already, yeah, I can see over there, the windows are already in there and that this is a, a come before us. So um, I'll move to count, I'll get Councillor Pearson to speak next and then we'll go to Councillor Bustling for his proposal to refuse uh, and the reasons, sorry, Councillor Davison's proposal and the refusal and the reasons why. Councillor Pearson. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, so my slight anxiety is we know that if we are going to go against the officer's recommendation, then we need to follow the guidance that's always that's in every one of our agendas, uh, page 110 in, the, in this case, um, where we give full reasons, the various issues that have been considered, the weight that we've given to each factor, and the logic for reaching the conclusion. I think we need to do that if you're going to propose uh, refusal. And that's why I was suggesting that we might want to defer to allow for the officers to come back and just clarify what the situation was. And I, I heard what Haley said about the um, building or the, the, the renovation of the upstairs spaces and the inclusion of the UPVC windows in that, which I believe you were su suggesting was out with the conditions of the 2017 application. But I think if we would have defer tonight, it would allow the officers to come back and just explain why we are where we are without getting into a bit of a mess by refusing and having a condition that goes for two, three or four years. So I would propose if somebody's willing to second that we defer and allow the officers to come back and clarify. Could, could we just start? Okay, so hold on. So we, we can take one motion at a time and we have a motion here that's already been proposed by Councillor da Davidson uh, for refusal. So I'm now going to move to him for him to uh, to give us the reasons for refusal because in case this goes to appeal you need to back up the decision that you're going to make to refuse this application. So Councillor Davison. As always I always listen and uh, Councillor Pearson has a valid point that uh, the officers have far more experience of listed buildings, sorry locally listed buildings <laughs> and uh, and I think it would be, be sensible to defer this uh, for and come back to us with solid reasons. One thing I would like to highlight, though, and it's in the report, is that actually the shape of the windows that have been replaced is not the shape of the original ones. It, they haven't got the arch on them, for example. And because it's such a significant building in the street scene, I think that should be one of the conditions that it's replaced in the same shape of, as the original if I can give some guidance. So I'm withdrawing my refusal. Okay, so you're withdrawing that, that proposal. Make it quick, because then we move on to the next it was proposal. Quick. I was going to ask you if you could kindly ask Simon what his views are. I know he's poised with his pen there, but I think this is rather important. Well, it is a very important. Do you, do you want to hear the proposal for Councillor Pearce in the second year, or shall we go on to you? Can I just clarify one point, please, Chair, for the, that Councillor Davidson raised? The majority of the windows in this building were not arched headed. There were, there were two vertically stacked windows on the corner, which were arched headed because they had arched surrounds. So in terms of the number of windows which don't match, it's two on the, on, on the canted corner. Um, the remainder do match, they were square headed um, as they are now. Um, so just to clarify that point, Chair, for Councillor Davidson, it's not all the windows weren't arch headed, two of them were. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Happy? 
thank you. That wasn't the point that I was raising, but you can make arch windows in plastic as well as wood. But never mind. The point that I was actually getting to was I would like to hear Simon's comments on Councillor Pearson's deferral proposal and whether or not that would be possible to work and whether or not officers could actually produce the reasons to actually support such a deferral. Thank you. The, if the, we, officers do not provide reasons for refusal anymore. It's been like that for some time now. Councillors have to come up with the reasons for refusal. It's why you're here and trained and experts and where we go. So I'll now move on to the proposal from Councillor Pearson for deferral, does he have a seconder for that? Seconded by Councillor Sam McLean. Thank you. So now move on to Simon to explain uh, the reasons why or why not we should go for or what, what could happen if a deferral happens. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yes, with regard to the question that I think Councillor Pearson is um, seeking to have clarity is whether the original consent for the conversion was implemented or whether we're actually looking at an implementation of the more recent consent. And it is my understanding that we're looking at a, an implementation of the more recent consent and therefore those conditions are inactive and superseded by the conditions on the more recent consent, which I'm looking to Haley to confirm did not include the window retention condition. So that is unfortunately consigned to planning history. Um, but with regard to the reasons for refusal, as Councillor Buston um, has raised, I think members have made it clear that the reasons for refusal um, are centred on harm to the character and appearance of the conservation area as alluded to in the report and in the representation made by the civic society that you believe that the harm is not outweighed by the public benefits of less than substantial harm and therefore our policies um, in the local plan and in the national uh, in, in statute kick in uh, as insofar as the proposal would fail to achieve the statutory test of preserve or enhance uh, and inadequate justification has been advanced in support of that change. Um, the applicant would, of course, have a recourse to appeal, should they, should they so choose. Um, we would obviously defend the council's decision. And um, in the event that that were dismissed, uh, the, uh, you could then, uh, in this resolution, um, as an informative, state that you are happy to provide a two-year period of grace um, during which no enforcement action will be taken to allow the applicant time to change the windows in accordance with details to be subsequently agreed with the local planning authority. Sorry, it's a bit breathless, but I hope it made some sense. Thank you, Chair. Okay, so now we move back to the proposal by Councillor Pearson to defer. We now need the reasons for the deferral for the official record that's been seconded by Councillor McLean and then the committee can then vote on your proposal and the reasons. Councillor Pearce. Thank you, Chair. And having just listened to Mr. Cairns, um, I, I, I think it's, it, it's disappointing that we allowed it to get to this stage without reference to the 2017 conditions. Um, but I hear what Mr. Cairns is advising us in terms of what we have before us tonight. So on that basis, I would withdraw my proposal to defer because I think we'll, all we'll hear is what we've already heard in the last few minutes. Um, and with that in mind, although I have some concerns, um, I think on the balance, I'm in favour of the um, recommendation that's in front of us this evening. <coughs> Okay, right, so now we're back to square one. So we don't have any proposals. Uh, the a vote has been taken to approve has been turned down. So are there any proposals? Councillor Tate, could you turn your mic on? I propose that we decline the application. I'll refuse you, mate. That's the word. So um, you... We have a, a, a proposal by Councillor Tate for refusal, seconded by Councillor Davidson. 
Could we have the reasons for a refusal, please? Uh, well, to uh, the wonderfully um, given by uh, Mr Cairns, basically the protection of the uh, conservation area. Um, is that good enough or is that some more? I'm happy with the two year um, stipulation to get it put right as well. If that's... I think that um, what, what do you say, Simon, that can be used as the reasons for refusal that council table will be happy with. Yes. yes, please, thank you. So now we move, we're now moving on to the vote. We can't keep talking about it all night. We have now have a, a proposal and a seconder to refuse this application as proposed by Councillor Tate, seconded by Councillor Davison. All those in favour of Sorry, point of order. Point of order. It's on licence. It? Well, it'll do. Point of order. Can we just be absolutely certain that the two-year deferral for enforcement is included in this? Actually, can I add to that about the correction for the Civic Society when I think of it? That be put down. Um, so, okay, so just hold on for a second. Robert. Chair, Chair um, I think it's quite clear that we just possibly need to take a couple of moments to write out the actual recommendations so that all members can hear what they are voting on before we go forward. So, Chair, if I could say that me and Simon have just a couple of moments to write that out, then that would probably be best so that we can move on to the vote. Because I'm not, I don't have it down in front of me what we're voting on either. I think well, I'm happy with that. We'll just take a couple of minutes out. We'll have it all set down in writing, and then we'll take the vote. Okay. Do you wish to take a break for five minutes, everybody?
Uh, we are now ready to resume the meeting again. And um, we're ready to read out. We're going to read out the re reasons for refusing for it. And then you can add or distract something if you're not happy with it. Please go ahead, Robert. Thank you, Chair. So, so comprehensive unauthorised replacement of the painted timber sliding sash windows has resulted in the less than substantial harm to the character and appearance of the Colchester No. 1 conservation area by reason of the uniform extruded appearance of the plastic frames, prominent trickle vents and reflective quality of the double glazed units. In the opinion of the local planning authority, inadequate justification advanced in support of harm identified to, desig to the designated heritage asset, contrary to policies ENV1, BM16 of the adopted local plan 2017 to 2033, together with paragraph 199, 202 and 203 of the MPPF 2023 edition, which seek to prevent and justify harm to the de designated heritage assets. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Tayas, proposal, are you happy with those? I am happy with that. Is there reference to the two year period or, or, or are we saying not to that? Thank you, Chair. We can add that as an informative that um, the, the local planning authority, having in regard to the circumstances of the case, um, has resolved not to take enforcement action for a two-year period with a stay of execution. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm quite happy now. So now um, we now move to the vote. If everybody's happy with that, so all those in favour of uh, the um, of refusal, as and as is all the conditions set out with by Robert Carmichael, please raise your hands for refusal. Six. All, those, all those against? Four. And no abstentions are taken now. So therefore, that application is refused. And now, thank you very much to those who are present. That's over. We now move on to the next application. And that is 7.5 land at Brazewick. We'll let people clear the room first and then we'll, we'll Okay, so um, we now have got um, 7.5 land adjacent to 67 Braiswick, Colchester. It's recommended for approval. Uh, presenting officer is John um, Miles. And we've got public speaking against David, David Meehan. And public for is Jack Barron. We have Councillor Sarah Naylor in person at the back there. Uh, and then we have statement for Councillor Barber. And Councillor Willis is here also to speak. So over to you, John. I believe that we're not going for the whole application again. We're just going to make comments on what, what has changed since the last deferral meeting and what we were asked to do. Over to you, John. Thank you, Chair. Yes, good evening, everyone. So for background, the application has been considered by members um, twice before, so on the 15th of June and most recently on the 17th of August, where the application was deferred to negotiate improvements um, to the layout um, in order to consolidate the public open space. Following the previous deferral and in response to the matters raised by members, the applicant has made changes to the layout of the scheme, um, which I will outline in a minute. 
I won't go into to much detail with these um, plans that, that, that most members will have, have seen before. I will just go through them um, quickly so that anyone who wasn't in attendance at the previous meetings has um, the additional context. This is the site plan um, off Colchester Road, the A12 over here uh, to the west, effectively forming um, a boundary around the city. The site forms part of the wider NC3 um, allocation for Braiswick, which is in the Section 2 local plan allocated for up to 70 dwellings. The site boundary is shown right, the wider allocation shown red on the left. So this plan most clearly shows um, the amendment that has been made since the application was previously considered by members. Members will note that there is now a larger um, area of public open space to the north of the site um, here. So this, this change has been made um, in response to, to, to members' comments and concerns about the, the, the western area of public, of public open space being um, peripheral in, in its location. It's considered that this revision provides an additional um, functional and desirable um, amenity area within the site, which in, um, in conjunction with the larger, more strategic area to the west, which includes the play area, um, it, it meets the 10% policy requirement for public open space um, as a percentage of site area. So again, members may note there's been a, a number of updated um, drawings. The, the reason a number of the drawings have had to be updated is to ensure the consistency between the plans. So because of that change to the public open space area, all the plans which show the site in its entirety have had to be updated to ensure there's that consistency there. So that, that's why there's a, there's a number of, say, updated refuse plans and updated um, tenure plans, the tenure refuse um, sort of facilities haven't changed, it's to ensure that consistency um, between the plans in terms of the public open space shown on the plans. So again, I'll just go through these relatively quickly because um, they remain largely unchanged. The tenure plan, it's the boundary plan and the hard landscaping plan. Now, these are some um, illustrative street scene and section drawings. Um, these are as th th this, this drawing is as, as um, shown to members before. And these drawings do not form part of the approved plans um, as given the need for precision and certainty over levels. There is a condition um, in the committee report which requires final level details, including spot heights and finished floor levels to be submitted um, for agreement. And that would include the areas of public open space to ensure that they're um, functional and um, accessible. Again, this is just another section drawing showing some of the um, indicative relationships between dwellings. And this is a further street scene um, drawing. This is the frontage to Braiswick Road. That's within the site, and that's to the north of the site at the top. Just go very quickly through these, just for the context. These are the house types the members will be familiar with. As previously discussed, um, the, the dwellings are considered to include a number of um, positive design features. Um, as Bison first submitted. And again, I'll just go quickly through the, um, the, the, the pictures again, that a, more, a majority of these have, have already been shown in previous committee meetings. So that's the site on the right. There's quite an established um, tree line there. The site on the left, again, located behind that established tree line. Another view. And it's a view looking directly towards the site, looking north. Looking south. I do have a couple of additional um, pictures this time around just to provide a bit of context for members in terms of the surrounding streets because I know that was something that was raised last time and um, hopefully that will assist in the considerations to whether the design proposed here is, is content contextually appropriate. That's some relatively recent development seen there on the left and there's a, a, a different view of it. It's a view to the south and this is a, a development very close by recently constructed Croft. Um, so as you can see, it adopts material palette of um, predominantly facing brick, with clay tiles. There is, you might not be able to see the resolution, but that's that's cladding to that um, that gable there. So the materiality is, is similar to what's proposed on the application site under this proposal. And there's also um, similar use of, of traditional detailing. And as outlined in the committee report, um, in addition to the changes to the public open space area since the previous meeting, the applicants have agreed to a revised um, wording of condition five which covers architectural detailing so um, they've also agreed that on the properties with a brick finish to the public facing elevations 
We'll have um, splayed brick lintels such as here and also stone sills with a view to further enhance the detailing and the site identity. Again, here are some other properties, predominantly two storeys um, in height and generally a mix of detached and semi-detached properties in the area. Again, I'll just go quite quickly through some of the site images showing it how it slopes down towards the west. Again, there's quite substantial tree lines to a um, majority of the, the boundary. The, the relatively flat area to the west of the site where the main public open space is proposed. And this is more up towards the north in the general area where that, that, that secondary um, but enlarged area of public open space is now proposed. That's a view to the, the rest of the allocation. Again, I'll go quickly through these. This doesn't change the detail previously shown, but it's, a, it's just a bit larger, so it might be clearer to members in terms of the detailing to the dwellings. It shows us a number of, as I said, um, as you can see, there's a number of positive design features, including um, details such as decorative fascia boards, exposed rafter feet, the use of timber cladding, um, and the use of brick plinths. This one, this property has a structural chimney, so it is considered that the, the properties do demonstrate a good quality of design in, in, in terms of the architectural detailing. And as I said, there is also that additional detailing secured by the reworded version of Condition 5, which will, which will further enhance the detailing. So these, yep, I believe are um, two of the affordable properties, still, um, still detailing proposed, the form of rafter feet, the uh, timber cladding, uh, central chimneys. And again, the materiality, the scale and the form of the properties is considered contextually um, appropriate for both the area and the site um, have, with due regard to those, um, those properties in the context that I showed, showed earlier. Here are some further properties and sort of some more information on the detailing. And this is the other um, house type which contains the, the affordable units. So again, detailing in condition five will further enhance the detailing in terms of splayed um, lintels above the windows and stone sills below the windows on the properties with a brick finish. And these are some um, illustrative computer generated images that the applicant has also provided since the previous um, committee. As I say, they're illustrative, but hopefully they give you a bit of a flavor of, um, of the proposal and really how it will feel sort of um, if, if, if it's built. This is the site entrance um, off Braiswick Road. The, um, the sort of gateway properties were a mi the mirror image of each other um, visible here. That first sort of slightly smaller area of public open space is sort of off in the distance here. And then this is a view from, with, um, sort of from on that area of public open space, which referred to as parcel one on the, on the plan. So this is the area that has been enlarged and it's considered its, um, its functionality and obviously its size has increased um, such that you know, this, this, this is considered will, will be an asset to, to the scheme and an additional area of public open space, which as I said, combined with this, um, this area of public open space that was previously proposed meets that 10% policy requirement in spatial terms. Um, they're the affordable units, some of the affordable units that you can see on the left there, which um, overlook the public open space. I'll just end on a site plan here and just do a very um, brief summary. Um, so as for the reasons outlined in the main body of um, the officer's report and for the reasons discussed um, in the presentation, officers are of the view that the proposals that before members today um, are in compliance with relevant policies of the development plan and um, acceptable in plan terms, including in terms of accessibility, connectivity, and um, the issue discussed um, last time, the, the, the position and provision of public open space. Officers consider that the scheme overall delivers an appropriate quality of design and subject to the imposition of the recommended conditions, the proposed development is considered acceptable in terms of the scheme's appearance, landscaping, layouts and scale and will deliver 27 sustainably located new homes, 30% of which will be affordable on what is, um, as discussed, an allocated site. So with the proposals otherwise considered acceptable with regard to wider material planning considerations, the recommendation put forward to members is one of approval subject to the conditions outlined. Thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions after um, this evening's speakers. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. One question I've got. Uh, what are the windows made of? I believe these are detailed. I'm not sure it's actually detailed, but there is a materials condition which will cover the finer details of, of things like the windows materials. But I, I would imagine likely it probably will be UPVC in this uh, more, more, more contemporary context. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so now, because of the... 
Oh, I, I was going to take the uh, one. So because it's got an extra added um, uh, bit to this, because the planning inspectors already had comments on that, we invited James Ryan to come along tonight to speak about what it means in terms of what the inspector said uh, as to this application. So please, Jane, give your extra officer's report. Thanks very much, Chair. Um, no, I'll be really quick. Um, it's I'm here because I dealt with the um, previous application, which was uh, 101522. Um, we received that application at outline stage uh, with the red line that John showed uh, previously. Um, I, th I think the message that you'll see from that refusal um, was that we considered the density of the development to be too high. Um, at the time, we considered the scheme to be premature as well because the um, maybe the development plan was in its uh, earlier stages, wasn't yet uh, through its examination in public and up to adoption. Um, but we really did run with an argument that I thought was quite sound at the time um, in terms of an overdevelopment over argument and an argument that there should be more dwelling spread throughout the wider allocation as opposed to just this site. But the house builders at the time, well, they're effectively land promoters, they, they are a house builder, but they didn't have any intention of bringing this forward. Um, one in with the 27. Um, it was a peculiar COVID hybrid hearing inquiry thing when um, both sides had um, barristers and we had some evidence given, but it wasn't under oath. We did have a consultant, um, Urban designer help us, who made, I thought, a really cognizant um, submission um, at setting out that this that 27 is just too many um, and we thought we argued it very very well but really the idea of why I'm here today is to tell you that the inspector simply did not agree with our arguments um, we said to him that ultimately it might be up to 27 but if you approve this scheme you are approving 27 and um, the applicants are well aware of that um, I think I said to him myself, it's extremely rare with an up to you ever get either not to the maxima or one less than the maxima. Very rare that a land promoter will promote a site and a developer to then buy it to deliver far less houses. Um, and we thought that our argument was very strong. Um, we had a significantly weighty statement of case for that hearing, including a large appendix by the urban design officer, consultant urban designer. Um, he went through the matter of levels and um, a number of the issues that have borne out to be true in many respects. Um, the, the difficulty that we set out with delivering a site like this for 27. But um, however hard we tried, we could not convince the inspector that uh, we were right in that instance. Um, and he granted um, permission for the 27, the up, the up to 27. So we a lot of the arguments that I've heard of previous deferrals are, I think we accept them, but ultimately that kind of argument has already been run. So we do have an ability to deliver 27 that has been assessed in quite some detail, in far more detail than you usually would expect at outline stage. Um, and in that respect, I'm actually quite impressed with the layout that has, that has come forward. I think it will sit comfortably in the context in which it sits. Um, I think the materiality is, is high quality, the affordable dwellings are, you know, appear tenure blind, um, the layout looks attractive, usable, I think the new public open space is excellent because it's going to sit at the end of the main access road where you will turn to the rest of the allocation eventually. Um, so I just wanted to put that to members ultimately, that um, this is not a case of us allowing a, a, a case of overdevelopment that argument has been run and was run really, really stringently, but it uh, it was not bought by the inspector. And uh, that's why we are where we are today, effectively. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. So now we move on to move on to the public speakers and for public against David Main, please. You have three minutes, David, if you remember, and the bell go after two. Thank you. NPPF Section 130, Paragraph F, Planning Decisions 
should ensure that developments create places that are safe, inclusive, accessible, and will promote health, well-being with a high standard of, of amenity. Keep that in your minds. In November 2022, this applicant submitted detailed civil engineering drawings showing the retaining walls necessary to maintain these site levels. An experienced civil engineer from the Residents' Association reviewed this artefact and behind the playground and across the west boundary open space in parcel two, there is a retaining wall with a drop of, 16, oh, sorry, of 19 feet. This ledge is the equivalent to jumping from a second story window. The proposed site the, propo the proposed site sections submitted last Thursday show proposed new levels, no doubt to appease the concerns about access. Not shown is the impact of, the, of this levelling has on the retaining wall at the edge of the site. It implies the play area might even be higher. The committee has already established that the accessibility of the play area and open space isn't the best. Let's not kid ourselves, it's not going to be used. No one has ever pur purposely placed a play area this close to the A12 where it is so loud that policies prevent house houses being built there at the same point. The tree canopy policy can't be met on site, so there's no additional pollution barrier, so it can't be described as healthy living. It certainly isn't a high standard of, of amenity, and the committee doesn't even know now whether it's safe for children. Please take a very, very close look at plot 1415 parcel one. Double garages with turning have been removed and replaced with single garages and back-to-back -back parking, forcing the new residents to skillfully reverse cars around public open space where they're told that children will be playing. We need to be serious. Despite the urgent need to build affordable housing in Colchester, it would be unwise for any one in this committee to approve and accept these risks without fully comprehending the potential consequences of these new material changes to the levels and safety concerns. The urban design officer, the appeal inspector, contrary to what we just heard, and even the applicant to a certain extent concurs with the committee's conclusion on the 15th that you cannot build 27 dwellings on an unsuitable site and maintain a high standard of immediacy for residents. I urge this committee again to reject the current proposal and demand a reduction in the number of dwellings. This will provide flexibility and design necessary to create a development of the quality expected from the neighbourhood plan, ensuring that Braiswick remains a desirable place for both new and existing residents. A minimum expectation is that the development is safe. Thank you. Thank you. And now, speaker four, Jack Barron, please. And you have three minutes, Jack, and the bill will go after two. <clears throat> Good evening, committee. Uh, thank you for letting me talk again this evening. So just to touch upon the comments there, the tree removal, I believe, has been uh, agreed at sort of outline stage. And in regards to the levels, there is a condition in place, sort of which the council can refer to. Since the deferral at the last committee, we have um, actually, so I've gone away to work with John to overcome the issues raised. In particular, we agree that the comment in regard to the provision of open space. Previously, we proposed an area of open space along the western boundary in a collection of small, but like, piecemeal areas. So, at working with John, we've since like, found a solution by removing the double garage to plot 15 to create a large, sort of usable, sort of landscaped area of open space, which is the main vista. So it's enjoyable for everyone. So, we live there. As well as the visitors of the development. Because this area sort of lies at the top of the hill, um, it's easily accessible for everyone, um, especially wheelchairs and pushchairs. The large area to the west of the site will retain because of the, the actual site's constraints as previously outlined, but these are two consolidated areas sort of, sort of now exceed the 10% sort of open space provision. And it's actually um, it's quite clear by the, uh, the plan provided that there are sort of like two sort of sort of large areas. It's fair to say that the site plans before did not actually give these areas much like justice. Parcel one is up to 23 metres by 35 metres and parcel two is up to um, 16 metres by up to like 72 like, metres in length. These are large areas. Therefore, we have provided the two like, CGIs sort of to illustrate these, the size and the usability of these areas. 
uh, that you see before you today. In hindsight, we wish that we made this amendment sooner. Um, and therefore, we so appreciate the committee's input um, into the design process. Since the last committee, we studied the character of Braidswick, in particular taking architectural sort of, sort of references from the Keepers Green development to ensure our proposed development appears in keeping to all with its locality. For the purposes of the committee, we prepared the zoomed in elevations of each of the homes uh, and advocating the high quality architectural detailing plus material palettes. It includes open eaves, uh, decorative fascia boards, brick plimps, high quality timber canopies, three sided bay windows, chimney breasts. The materials include high quality red brickwork, render, timber boarding, and clay roof tiles. Lastly, I would Back like to, to add. I'm afraid, sorry. Sorry. Oh, was it two minutes? No, it's three minutes. Yeah. Sorry, okay. I'll give you an extra few seconds. Sorry about that. Cheers, thank you. So lastly, I'd like to add that this South Grid is a bore of homes. It's not a large house builder, it's not the Bellway, it's not the Persimmon, it's not the Barretts. They are local, they're based at Stanway. Uh, they just built some bungalows up down at Nayland. Uh, they're very high quality. Uh, we're just building some actually uh, family homes up down at Gosfield. And as such, they pride themselves on the quality sites and quality locations as such as this at Braiswick. Um, in conclusion, I thank you for your previous feedback. Uh, we hope you agree that we've thoughtfully considered these comments and actually sort of amended the scheme in response to these comments raised. Uh, thank you for listening. Thank you. I apologise for the interruption. <laughs> you can have a couple of more seconds if you want. Could you turn the microphone off, please? Thank you. And now we'll move on to uh, councillors. I believe Councillor Naylor is first. Do you want to go first or Councillor Naylor, please? You have five minutes and the bell will go after four. Apologies, Chair. Councillor Naylor, I believe. Would you, did you want some material shown on the screen? Yes, no problem. I was going to say we have a page that comes up. Really. So was that the one, section D to F? Yes. <coughs> Thank you, Chairman, for allowing me to address the committee for a third time. I'm the ward councillor for Lexton and Braiswick. I called in this application on design grounds for trying to cram 27 houses onto a severely constrained plot that lies to the south of the Blue Bridge connecting Braiswick to West Burgold. Members have been patient with the applicant and their paid advisors who seem to lack respect for your responsibilities. The application was right twice deferred for meaningful design improvements, including consolidating public open space. The applicant still says it must cram 27 houses onto the top and upper sides of a steep slope because further downhill is too steep and too near the noisy A12. However, they consider that the same noisy, out of sight, steep slope is still the right place for a safe children's playground. The urban design officer did make fresh comments, but his lukewarm view of the design stated in paragraph 8.15 of the committee report still stands. Design isn't about adding fake chimneys or stone lintels. When councillors consider design, we think about substance and community. Where will children play safely and independently? Can families trust it was designed in their best interests if the play equipment is midway down the steepest part of the slope and largely out of sight? Design principles are about what it's like to live there after the applicant has cashed in and gone. We have to be sure safety flaws aren't designed in at approval stage that residents or council taxpayers might have to put right at great cost. If the applicant had this in mind, they would now be presenting you with a better design. The latest design tweak amounts to reassigning Plot 15's front drive as an impractical, tiny public open space, reimagined as ideal for dog walkers and toddlers in pushchairs. The applicant's visuals don't portray the risk from cars now reversing in or out of Plot 15, 
Is this because there's now nowhere to turn, narrowly passing the same toddlers and dogs? Public open space parcel one doesn't seem to be a usable public space at all. Proposed street scene D to F on the screen is a new document. It introduces fresh safety concerns for the children who will play on the equipment on parcel two public open space. I think it's EE -E in the middle. It shows a new flattened level and beneath is a broken red line illustrating the original levels. It shows a big rise in the height of the affordable housing levels. The question is, what effect does this have on the gradient, the western boundary of the site where the playground abuts? There are no accompanying illustrations or technical drawings to show this to the committee. It stops before it gets to the playground. Braswick Residents Association referred to a civil engineer's opinion of a 2021 technical engineering drawing. He says the land abutting the playground boundary drops by 5.8 metres. That's 19 feet. So the applicant insists that the best playground site is next to a drop that's at least equivalent to falling out of an upstairs bedroom window. There will be a fence, but children climb fences and often fall off the other side. What happens to the child that falls off this playground fence? And who sees, given the child can't then be seen by any house? You're being pressed to rubber stamp this because people need affordable homes. This logic sweeps away the committee's overriding duty to ensure developments don't design in risks to families who live there. Braswick Residents Association speaks up for future neighbours' children who need safe places to play. We're at an impasse that could be solved by consolidating the public open space, as you requested in August, to create a centralised playground. My concerns prompted me to write to ROSPA, seeking its expertise in preventing accidents relating to the siting of playgrounds. I'm concerned about the lack of time given to this application and for its reflection. It's rushed. You've been, been given 43 documents in the last week to look at as recently as yesterday. I'm asking you to refuse or at least defer in order to consider ROSPA's safety expertise, the deluge of documents, and to evaluate the application five minutes for emerging safety risks. Okay, thank you. You done. Thank you. Anyway. Thank you, you very much. Got, you nearly got there. And now speaking against Councillor Winners, please. You know the score, Dennis. Oh, hang on, I do, Chairman. I'll try not to repeat what has been said already. Uh, I mean, it's. Um, it's an ongoing argument whether there should be 27 houses built on this site. Uh, we all have our own opinions, but the inspector has ruled, and in this world, when a planning inspector rules, um, that is the end of the argument uh, on the number of, uh, uh, of houses. And we note that there is a significant need for housing in the city, uh, and this, of course, will make a contribution both to private housing and also to, uh, to social housing. And I, I think those matters are not disputed. But what, what does come to the fore is neither the local residents, the parish council, nor the ward councillors are really happy that this design on the side of a steep hill achieves what we perceive to be a high standard design. And I think that has been put very clearly, very succinctly uh, by Councillor Naylor. Uh, and we focus on uh, policy DM12 housing standards in our own planning raft of policies. Um, residential development should be of a high standard of design and layout, um, and that is what should be promoted. And in the, uh, the neighbourhood plan for Mayland and Brazen developers should achieve the highest quality of design commensurate with current national and local design guidance. And the general feeling is that there will be 27 houses here, but the current proposals, and they've come, they've gone round and round and round the houses, still do not, um, do not evidence uh, a safe uh, and supportable plan uh, to the local population. And that should be one of the criteria uh, that we aim for in, in planning. 
Reading the report, I get the feeling that the urban design officer is still not quite with us on, uh, on, uh, on this particular application, uh, referring to the dull consistency of the proposed layout and the built environment, uh, lacks significant features that contribute to positive placemaking, and this is what we want. Originally, we want housing, but they must be uh, of a high standard. We note that it broadly complies with the requirements for form and materiality, but fails to achieve a high degree of visual interest, distinctive character, identity and safety. And certainly the slides that I saw earlier on with a few fake chimneys here and there does not convince anyone really, Chairman, uh, that this estate is going to look uh, as good as it should, as good as the city of Colchester um, should expect. The applicant's strategy seems to be to com continue submitting minor amendments which do not materially improve the design, and of course that's always a matter of opinion, uh, Chairman, in the hope that the committee will eventually be embarrassed by the number of times it has to send this back to try and get it to conform with good planning practice, and perhaps out of desperation gives planning consent just to put the matter to, res uh, to rest. And I feel that would be a great shame. We should be persevering to get a good, high, safe standard of design uh, for this site. Um, we've heard why the, the, um, the application was sent back on the, the 17th of, um, of August, um, and uh, I am frankly unconvinced by the issues that we've seen. Um, we've already heard the local residents talk about the what was a, 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 a shuffling around of plots 14 and 15, doing away with double glaze, double garages for five bedroom houses, uh, having a single drive that they need to reverse down. It, it seems to contradict all what I see in the residency as matters of safe, good uh, design. Where I, I, I have the greatest worry, Chairman, uh, is that there is a, a material change to the levels. It is built on a hill. I believe that it is possible to produce a good, safe design. Many places have housing developments on the side of a hill. The documents which we and the residents have seen so far does not convince us that this design has yet been optimised. I believe it can be optimised, but at the moment, too many shortcuts are being taken to try and get this development over the hurdles set by this committee. So in summary, Chairman, I believe that this is the planning equivalent of shuffling the chairs on an ill-fated ship. Ward councillors and local residents want a detailed plan that gives a high degree of visual interest, distinctive character, identity, safety, and actually shows us how these uh, buildings can be safely accommodated on a site with the, uh, the adverse levels. That was your five minutes, I'm yeah. afraid. Uh, what we would like now, Chairman, is you to defer or reject <laughs> until, this, uh, until we have achieved this good standard of planning, Chairman. Thank you for the extra 10 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. Well, and well got in there, very good. Uh, you have to admire him. Uh, and then we have a statement that uh, Robert Carmichael read by Councillor Lewis Barber. Thank you, Chair. Dear Committee, you will be hearing this application once again after a... Sorry, I'm a bit closer. Dear Committee, you will be hearing this application once again after a further referral. I think that should be deferral, but it... I'll say referral just for clarity's sake. Um, I thank you for the time you have given this application to try and resolve the outstanding issues. Unfortunately, it is my view that the additional public open space is insufficient to overcome the issues the committee have rightfully identified. For example, the committee is aware that the neighbourhood plan policy, which adopted, which is adopted policy of the council that specifies as follows, HOU1, Developers should achieve the highest quality of design commensurate with current national and local design guidance and DPR1. Developments will aim to attain the highest quality and design standards 
and where appropriate encourage the use of relevant national standards by developers in order to achieve the highest possible levels of overall sustainability in the design and layout of new developments. The urban design officer once again notes issues with the proposals. This consistency, and this is quoted, uh, quote marks, this consistency in the composition of the proposed built environment combined with its homogeneous placement results in a lack of distinct identity and visual interest across the site. Close brackets. But sorry, close uh, speech mark. Once again, the application has, has not reached the necessary planning standard. It is timely to remind the committee that the outline permission is an up to permission, not a fixed amount. Therefore, while the applicant may be able to reach this threshold, there is not a planning right to do so. Other factors must be taken into account. These factors continue to not be satisfied, such as policies HOU1 and DPR1. On this basis, I urge the committee to make a decision this evening to reject the application. Councillor Lewis Barber. Yeah. In this statement, you said up to, but there's definitely 27. No, the planning inspector said it had to be 27 dwellings. It's an up to. He's absolutely right. It's an up to twenty-seven. Is it up to twenty-seven? But the argument, yeah, the argument we raised at uh, the appeal was that a twenty-seven is he is granting permission for twenty-seven, but, and they can do less absolutely and still be within the confines of the outline permission. However, as I said at the um, hearing, it's highly unlikely that any developer is going to come and do ten because they they won't. Um, so. He has granted permission for 27, but it would be lawful to have less. Okay, thank you. Any comments made about um, anything in there, John? Sure. Yep, I'll try and come back on uh, the couple of points that were raised in order. So firstly, with the levels, just to clarify, the, the, the levels haven't changed since the application was previously considered by members. There is an updated proposed street scene drawing that was on the screen a moment ago, and that is to take into account, effectively, my understanding is the difference in the means of enclosure because the public open space has got bigger. So again, that's more of a consistency thing rather than that updated drawing has made a material change to the levels previously proposed. And an earlier iteration of that street scene drawing um, has been has, has been available since April 2023. There was a previous iteration um, in November 2022, and there were the very original street scene drawings which were submitted in March 2022 which were at different levels because as, as we've discussed the scheme has evolved and changed um, since that point. In terms of the, um, the sort of public open space areas themselves, um, they are according to, to sort of the, the, the levels that have been provided relatively flat, they're, they're certainly flat enough that they're accessible. It is recognised, there is a difference, there is a fairly substantial difference it is recognised in terms of the level between the, the western area of public open space and the land beyond. And that's something that has been recognised by officers and it has been responded to by way of a condition. Apologies, I'll just... No. So officers are very aware that there will need to be satisfactory boundary treatments there. It will need to be demonstrated that there will not be a safety risk and that appropriate levels can be demonstrated and that is what the developer will have to demonstrate if if they want that condition discharged and that condition is prior to commencement so there can't be spade there can't be a spade in the ground until they have demonstrated to officer satisfaction that those levels are acceptable there are appropriate means of enclosure and ultimately that public open space is accessible and safe um, to be used by future occupiers and that condition requires spot heights sections it requires a great deal of detail so we we are requiring that certainty from the developer through that condition we will need acceptable details submitted so officers consider that that does provide us that certainty and that security in terms of levels and safety there are further conditions as well covering um, masses of boundary treatments so say for, for the eastern area of public open space there are timber bollards that's going to be enclosed in a sense but still accessible because the bollards effectively prevent cars but still allow people to, to come and go. There has been a change to the, um, the parking provisions to the plots to the north of the site to accommodate that public open space. However, both of those plots retain parking that is in excess of our minimum standards. So both of those dwellings have two uncovered parking spaces and they also have a single garage each. So that is an over provision of parking there. 
So I think that, that covered all the matters on, um, on the levels and sort of matters raised. I know we've discussed um, design in, in detail already, so I won't go over that again. But if there are any further areas of clarification in terms of design itself, I'm, I'm more than happy to come back on that if that would assist members. Thank you. Right, over to members who want to start us off. Has anyone got any comments to make? Councillor Tate, please. I've got a slight concern um, built up over a couple of years now, been on the planning committee. So if we make it a condition that they have to do appropriate safety uh, measures, what will make sure that they happen? How can we ensure there won't be a, a request for change of conditions or a retrospective change further down the line? Thank you. Yes, so that, that condition would effectively go, go to the very heart of the permission. And as we heard earlier, um, there was that permission where they didn't comply with the conditions and effectively they were left without the permission and had to reapply. And if they did wish to vary that condition, it would ultimately then come back to us to make that decision. We could say, no, we impose that condition for very good reason, as outlined on the reason of that condition. And ultimately, we have the say there. They obviously have the right to appeal, but if any inspector was it was before them there is a clear reason for that condition it clearly meets you know the officer's opinion the test for planning condition it's it's very precise it's enforceable there's a clear reason there's a clear justification so officers do consider that that does provide us the the certainty the security and if needs be we don't expect it to get to that stage the enforceability in terms of issues of, of levels and means of enclosure any other you have with it Councillor Davison, please. Um, thank you, Chairman. Um, well, here we are again. Um, there are there have been some changes this time, whereas last time there hadn't been very much. But I've got real concerns, and I hear what the uh, Mr. Miles has been saying. But um, forgive me. Uh, one, the old yellow plan is open space, public open space, and this time we've got two green areas of open space, and yet. This one complied with the 10% area, and apparently this one does too. So this must be 15% at least, or more. And so that, that's my first concern. You know, there's such a difference, and why, why are we losing all this open space in parallel with the current road? Um, secondly, uh, plot 15. I have real concerns that, yes, there may be parking for two or three cars for a five five bed house and a single garage. But the point made by both councillors was that actually there is no way of turning or you have to reverse back out through the, uh, the play area, number one, to get onto the main highway. And I, and I just wonder, the other thing is, of course, that plot 15 has no front garden now. Uh, the, the, the new area of green space actually goes right up to the, the patio around the house. And I just think that's, that's impractical and it's a, an accident waiting to happen. The other thing that concerns me as well is the levels. Um, we've already heard from Councillor Naylor that the playground, the green area number two, uh, there is a 19 foot drop that's the same as jumping out the top top window uh, down to the land outside the uh, applicant's control that that is an accident waiting to happen you know do you put a five foot fence there do you put a 10 foot wall do you put a 15 foot wall to try and stop them but children being children they'll they'll put a plank up against it and try you know it's an inquis it's inquisitive isn't it they it's an accident waiting to happen. What we wanted was a central community space uh, to make sure, make the whole uh, development have a sense of sense of uh, place and involvement. And yet again, we've been forced into uh, considering the ones right on the boundary, which, which understandably it's at the bottom of a slope. But then we have this other drawing, which uh, Mr. Miles put up to see, where it actually says in small red print, uh, 
red line indicates previous proposal. So sure enough, the previous proposal, the affordable housing was a lot lower. Uh, and so uh, that was, and at that lower level, that's where the 19 foot drop came by the playground. We're now going up by another five, 10 foot. Uh, it, it's just another accident waiting to happen. So I'm, I'm minded. I mean, we've given this application two opportunities to uh, come back with something acceptable. They are starting to listen, but they haven't really given what I call a sense of community here. Um, one other little item, uh, Mr. Miles also showed us a recently, uh, recently completed development, which had a, a brick uh, entrance effectively, brick pillars on the entrance. But I did notice on that one, there was absolutely no footway for, for the public or the children in the push chairs to actually get onto the main road. So I, I would, would hope that there's going to be a footway out to the main road and to the, uh, so at least they can get to the bus. Um, but uh, the other thing is on, um, if I looked at the levels, levels on this uh, open area part one, um, I believe those are something like 12 foot above, above the house front door. That means again, that people are going to be sitting on these benches, which we saw nicely illustrated on the, on the plan, and effectively looking to people's bedrooms. Uh, is that really what's wanted? And I know Mr. Miles has consistently said the levels have yet to be agreed, but that's the point. We don't know what we're agreeing and we do, will not, we will not accept an unsafe and un, un, unacceptably low quality of community. So uh, I will wait to hear the other comments made, but I'm not happy with what every proposing today. Thank you. I think we've made some valid points there and to back up Councillor Davis' points, where the um, where the playground area is, what what is the material is going to be built on? Because as you said, that they are going to put uh, uh, planks up there, try to climb on the top. If they do fall off the other side, is it a sand pit or is it just artificial grass, which would be very hard and um, I know children bounce at early ages, but a lot of broken arms will be quite dodgy. And the other one was the reverse and of the new player, uh, the, the parking. Were the highways panel consulted over that as a potential safety risk? Because uh, people drive in and then will reverse out. So that is a bit of a worry. And uh, were the um, highways consulted over that, the new proposals? Thank you, Chair. Yep, so I'll try and again run through the points. In terms of the um, public open space plan that Councillor Davidson um, raised, the previous iteration, as you say, showed more areas. This one, the current um, public open space plan shows the two green areas. So my understanding is that was to make it clearer to members that there had been effort made to consolidate the main areas of public open space. So those other areas that are shown on the previous iteration of the public open space plan, they're still shown on the management plan to be communally managed. So they're not going to be private gardens, they're not lost. This enlarged public open space is in addition to those incidental areas. In terms of the, the, the garden to plot 15, I was just going to, to assist members. Help the, so yeah, while they, while they don't have effectively a front garden, which well, they, they previously had the, the the parking area so the parking area as we said has been removed however they're still considered uh, to be provided with acceptable parking that property in particular plot 15 i'll just double check that's the correct correct number they are very very generous gardens still it's so plot 15 has 231 square meters of private amenity space and i believe off the top of my head our standard for a four bedroom is 100 square meters so it is a significant over provision, they still do have a very generous garden. So officers don't consider that in large public open spaces is, is by any means at the cost of the amenity of, of that occupier. If anything, it's probably going to be more pleasant looking out on a green grassed area rather than their car to the front of the window. Appreciate the, the, the comment about the levels. Obviously, 
we wouldn't want the level of that public open space to be so high that effectively you could see into that, that, that property's windows. And while we're not approving the levels today, it's not that no levels information has been provided or we're effectively going into this blind. The detailed landscape plans which have been submitted at every iteration do have some bites. They do identify fin finished floor levels. So that has allowed officers to, to, to give that assessment and to consider in practical terms, do we think these properties can achieve an acceptable relationship with one another? Is the public open space at a level such that it's accessible? So we, we do have that baseline level of information to make that assessment, which has led officers to consider that those finer details can be controlled through that quite strictly worded um, condition. In terms of the question about the public open space being provided centrally, Again, I think it goes back a bit to the, the appeal where um, it was discussed the, the principle of Arcadian development. So the development effectively being dispersed around central natural features. And the inspector specifically did comment under that appeal that he didn't consider the site lent itself to that form of development because the natural form is around the edges of the site. So if you were to push the, and effectively it is the edge of the site here that is the focal point because they're the mature trees, they're what we're looking to retain and that's what is providing the outlook to the properties. So again, I, I think there is some bearing of that appeal decision on the position of the public open space. But if we do look at what, what is before members, as we've said, those two large, now considered large areas of public open space, they are policy compliant in that they meet that 10% of the site area. And as we said, that's an addition to those incidental areas, which are still proposed to be communally managed. In terms of access and a footway, there are conditions on the original permission which requires highway improvement works and, and a bus stop to the front of the site. So those matters are effectively dealt through the outline permission, which dealt with access. And in terms of sort of the, the public open space, its, its relationship to the other side, my understanding is, is it's grass, there's, there's quite dense tree cover. And as we said, that, that levels condition, if I just read one of the sentences, so from condition three, in instances where the details illustrate substantial variances in the proposed levels, details should be submitted that demonstrate how the transition between the levels will be facilitated. And then the development shall thereafter be carried out in accordance with the approved details. So it does specifically consider that, 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 you know, that, that, that situation that there may be you know, quite substantial variances, but that condition, is, as we said, is there in our view, it provides that safety and that security that appropriate details be submitted before the development can go ahead because the condition is prior to commencement. Hopefully that, that answers everything, but happy to come back. Thank you. Uh, Chair, Chairman, if I could just come back. Um, Mr. Miles, do, is it possible for it to come back to the committee to see what the final design and uh, plan is? Well, thank you, Chair. No, the discharge of condition mechanism uh, is, is one that does not involve referral of discharging conditions to planning committee and um, we have full delegation on those and indeed we aren't legally obliged to undertake any public consultation um, on discharge condition it's purely down to technical assessment of the details submitted however those details would be very carefully considered by both the council's urban designer and landscape officer to ensure that those details are safe practical and visually acceptable Apologies, just, just to add on to that, if, say, the applicant were to seek to vary the condition, then that would be an application that we would have to consult on. So if they sought to vary the contents of that condition, there would then be the ability for that to come back before members and be reconsidered. Yeah, as I say, we're, I'm just so unhappy with the, uh, the, the proposal, especially the change in levels. And uh, um, we, we want to be proud of this when it's, uh, when it's built. And I, th I think the developer would like it to be a, a well-designed well uh, project as well. Um, the, other th the last thing I meant to mention, there was no mention of any green energy heating or charging for car electric cars. Uh, is that automatically put in on our yeah. developments now? Thank you. So under um, building, building regulations, they would be required to have an EV charging point. Per, um, per vehicle and there's also the requirement for um, sources of renewable energy. I believe in this case it's air source, air source heat pumps but that, that it's outlined in I know in their design and access statement and I believe there's a separate plan um, and I can find exactly that is if that would help but there are provisions there in the, is the short of it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, Councillor Buston, please. Oh, thank you very much indeed, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman. Well, that's an interesting one. <clears throat> I think the uh, the moral is not to sub when there's something like this coming on. Um, I have no difficulties personally with the finishes and the detailed design. Indeed, I've been rather pleased to see those in Marlow way. <clears throat> uh, however, um, also in number two, uh, Simon will be delighted to know that I've got no difficulties with the roof heights. Um, in um, I do, oh, all right then. Um, I do have some concern, however, and I think this is the driver to the whole estate with what's going to happen to the east of the development because the road that leads in, the access road, leads very abruptly to a red line and there's lots and lots of uh, land behind there which clearly is intended to form part of a future development. Therefore, I can see the driver of this estate as to why and how it has been configured as it has. It doesn't make it acceptable, but I can see how it's come about. And that the point of concern there is that the items that are being used as public open space for this little chunk of it are actually going to be used by everybody else as well. They're not just going to be restricted to numbers 1 to 15 or numbers 1 to 27. They're going to be used by everyone else. So the substantial nature of that leads to some concern, particularly the latter amendment to plots 14 and 15. Coming on to plots 14 and 15, um, I wonder what's being gained there, frankly. I almost think it's better the way it was before because I think it's actually creating a danger. So therefore I agree with um, the points that were made by uh, Councillor Davidson in regard to that. I do have some concerns um, about plots four and five, which I understand to be uh, housing accommodation for shared accommodation, um, shared ownership accommodation, as opposed to social housing. The size of those plots look to me to be amazingly small. Uh, I'd, I'd certainly like some assurance that they're actually uh, large enough, the open space, to comply with the policies that we have in regard there too. And I say that because Although they're shared ownership accommodation, they fall in many ways into the same bracket as social housing. And I don't particularly see that social housing should be prejudiced in regard to the um, open space that they have compared to other properties. Are we My, uh, getting there for the questions? Because we No. Thank you, Michael. Be patient. My <clears throat> question seven is who's actually going to manage and look after and maintain the public open space after the development has been completed? I'm sure there is a, a, a formula for that. But I have seen lots of public open spaces that have been almost left abandoned. Um, I'd like to know that. Uh, but lastly, and most significantly, I do have significant concerns about the safety points, particularly as raised by the, the ward councillors. I would be very uncomfortable about agreeing an approval without hearing the results of the application that I understand has been made uh, according to uh, Councillor Nader's submission um, to ROSPA. Um, I think it would benefit us all to hear the results of that before a permission is granted. They are independent and I think we owe a duty to the people who are going to live in this estate in the future to, to have that to hand. We're building, not for now, we're building for the future. We must be very, very careful not to build properties just to get them built and get them done. We need to make sure they're safe for the, for the benefit of those that follow us. Those are my points. I hope I didn't delay the committee too long. Thank you. 
Anything you want to respond to that, please, John? Thank you. I'll try and go through those points uh, quickly. So the first one, access to the remainder of the allocation. Yes, the road has been designed in that manner to ensure it doesn't preclude access to the remainder of the allocation. Under the outline permission, there's a unilateral undertaking, so a legal agreement, which requires um, whoever owns that land to provide that access in perpetuity to the remainder of the allocation. So that there is a view there that there is that link, there is that connectivity that's, that's embedded there. In terms of, yes, it, it will be open to the public open space to, to members of the wider community. But what we wouldn't want, I don't think, is a gated community. It's, it's going to be it, that, that in itself would help, help integrate the development with the wider community. And it's also an asset to the wider community. And that there's, 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 there's play provisions that I don't know where the nearest ones are, but there's additional play provisions on the site there. So that's a potential benefit. Um, it's considered for, for the local community. In terms of the safety of the public open space, there's a good degree of natural surveillance. There's properties facing onto both of the areas. They're not tucked away, hidden. It's, there's a good level of natural surveillance from the properties, um, given the layouts. The properties that were referenced, plot four and plot five, appreciate the gardens look small. I think that's partly a contextual thing in that, as I said, plot 15 has a garden of in excess of 200 square meters, which is far higher than we'd normally see on, um, on sort of a, a development of this scale. So in comparison to that garden, yes, it, it, they do look relatively small, but in terms of our adopted standards, they're both three bedroom properties and that the standard for three bedroom property is 60 meters squared. Plot four has 104 square meters of amenity space while plot five has 97 square meters. So both of those plots have in excess of our, our minimum standards in terms of amenity provisions. In terms of management of the public open space, there is a landscape implementation and management condition and also on the outline permission, um, I believe there's another management condition in terms of a management company. Hopefully it answers all those. Thank you. Councillor uh, Buster, are you happy with this? Um, yeah, thank, thank you. I would ask in relation to uh, the man management um, issue, having done this for about 30, 40 years, if the management company is left to the residents, it won't be done. Um, bluntly because whoever does it to start with gets fed up with it doesn't want to do it nobody else wants to take it on um there needs to be a, a more uh, robust approach to that obviously i don't know what it is because i haven't been into it in detail but i merely um uh, flagged that up as a point in regard you you thank you for your comments in regard to the layout of the um the the, the play area um it, it, it seemed to me, just looking at the levels as I have seen them, that it would be unlikely that the bottom of the play area would actually be able to be seen from um, plot uh, 6 to 10. Uh, I don't know, um, unless somebody who's in the upper window looking, um, or am I, am I wrong in that? Because I thought the land dipped away quite... Uh, so substantially there are have I got that wrong John so yeah I'll just um, say on the levels and I think James was going to come in on, in terms of the management so as I say that we're not approving the levels at this stage but the level information we do have the indicative levels shows the finished floor levels uh, this on the landscaping plan of the properties which face that area of public open space are around 26 um, meters above the the, the the datum point on the site and then uh, one of the spot heights to the edge of the public open space to the west is 26.2 metres. They're sat relatively level, so then the windows are going to be set higher, and it is considered, you know, there the, the, the will be, you're probably not going to see it from your kitchen sink because it's out of the back, and you're not going to see it when you're sat on the sofa. But the, the, the point is there is a spatial relationship between them. There is that natural surveillance, whether it's not someone looking out the window, but it's, it's a perception of, you are being overlooked, and that's that's where the natural surveillance comes in. James, may want to come in on the management. Thank you. You know, just to make the point that the um, management company or transfer to the council, um, our parks and recreation team, um, is set out in the legal agreement, which was uh, part of the outline permission. So there's a, an either or option. Um, so there's we can't control that at reserve matter stage, unfortunately. But there is uh, the option for them for. Uh, us as an authority to take the land on if we wish to um, and if the applicants wish to allow us to um, and there's a maintenance fee in there as well to help us maintain it so but that is an outline matter and that was dealt with um, by the legal agreement so we can't change that now okay Councillor Pearson 
Thank you, Chair. I was uh, pleased that uh, Councillor Davidson asked questions that I was going to ask about uh, charging points, etc. So that's good. That I'll chalk that one off. Um, I also think I'm, I'm hearing very clearly from our officers that with regard to the levels, which did give me a bit of anxiety to begin with, and I recognise that as a substitute for Councillor Warns, I'm coming to this later than the majority of them have, um, but hopefully with a fresh pair of eyes. And I think the conditions that have been suggested to us this evening should give us um, assurance that the levels around that play area will be dealt with appropriately. Um, I was just having a quick look uh, at the map and thinking about First Or Drive in Lexington and Braiswick, which backs onto the A12. There's an open wood site at the end of that road. Children play in there, I know that, and, and get very close to the A12. Similarly, looking at Dragonfly Drift, which is, right, which is built on the old railway sidings, that's right next to a rail line where trains hammer down there at 100 miles an hour plus. And touch wood, as far as we're aware, there have never been any major incidents there. I look at, uh, I think about Stanway development, you've got the lakes. I was anxious about those when they were first approved before I became a councillor, thinking that that was a danger to children. Again, touching wood. There have been no incidents there. So I think we need to be, I think we need to be very cautious about using that as a reason, a, a material planning reason for objecting to this. Um, I, I hear what we've been told as well about what the inspector said around um, agreeing to up to 27 properties. So I think we'd be on a hiding to nothing if we were to refuse this. Um, I, I, and in terms of the, the last point I was going to make was about reversing out of driveways. Most of us don't have a big turning circle in our, at our homes where we can drive in and drive back out in a, in, in a forward. I have to drive. I have a relatively reasonable plot of a, a home, but I still have to back out of my driveway. And all my driveways I've had to back out of, and most of the driveways people go into, they have to back out of. So I don't see that as a major issue in terms of granting planning consent this evening. Um, yeah, I've got, I've got some ongoing anxieties, but I'm reassured by the fact that our officers are saying that there will be conditions on the levels to ensure that the totality of this development is in line with, I think, what most of us would want. So I'm prepared to propose that we accept the recommendation that's before us this evening, Chair. Okay, thank you for that. Is there a seconder for that? Oh, okay. Councillor McCarthy, I'll second that. So um, I'll just, so we've got one more speaker for waiting ages. So we'll take Jackie first, uh, please. I would say it's, it's been covered what I was going to ask, so I will withdraw. Thank you. Okay, so to so. Okay, so um, are there any more speakers? So we have a proposal to accept uh, approval, and we have a seconder here. So um, we will now move to the vote for the application. So all those in favour of the application for approval, please raise your hands now. Eight. Those against? One. Those abstaining? One. So that is recommended for approval and has been passed. Thank you very much for attending. And with that, that concludes the meeting of the night. Thank you very much, everybody.